cyclosmic adriamycin taxanes and platinum agents and um, we see significantly higher pathologic complete response rates compared to, to luminal hormone receptor positive breast cancer when we use chemotherapy. And nowadays with, 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 um, with a, appropriate treatment, we can see a complete response, complete abolition of all tumor in up to 50% of patients when treated with chemotherapy. And this, this it correlates well with an improved uh, outcome. The patients who, who have a pathology to complete response have, a nine, uh, have an 82% lower death rate than those patients who do not achieve a pathologic complete response. Optimal chemotherapy regimen is a combination of these drugs. And here's an example of a patient I treated about over 10 years ago. Um, this is the MRI, of course. You can see that the right breast is grossly distorted with skin thickening, massive tumor here that measured 10 centimeters, almost five inches in diameter with a huge lymph node in the axilla. Now, 10 years ago, prior to, to, to recognize, and this is triple negative breast cancer, recognize, before we recognized how sensitive these drugs were to chemotherapy, the only treatment for this patient would have been a mastectomy. And even then her, her chances of cure would be very small. But with four treatments of chemotherapy alone, and this was 10 years ago and our treatments have changed since then, here's the result. You can see this mass is significantly smaller. The lymph node is almost back to normal size. The breast looks normal compared with the other side in terms of the size of the breast. And the most important to note is that the time when this, this patient had a breast, had a lumpectomy with a reduction over here, everything that you see here was scar tissue. This, this patient had a pathology, pathology complete response, post-operative radiation, 10 years later, she's, she's free, cancer free. And this is a, an example of just how effective chemotherapy can be in triple negative disease. Um, I mentioned earlier that the, the triple negative breast cancer is not one single entity. And we now know there's at least four basic types. There's what's called the luminal androgen receptor, Androgen is testosterone. So these tumors have a receptor similar to the estrogen receptor, um, but, but for, not for estrogen, but for, the, the, for androgen. Um, there's a, what's called a mesenchymal disease, which is a, a, a more aggressive type of cancer. And then there's a basal type, either immunosuppressed or immune activated. The immune activated patients uh, have the best prognosis and they respond beautifully to immune, immunotherapy. And I'm going to show you an example of that in a moment or two. The details, I don't expect you to, to recall. Just, just the basic fact is there's different types of, of triple negative breast cancer, they have different prognosis and they're actually treated in different ways. And we're gonna talk about some of those treatments now. There's lots of emerging um, uh, newer treatments for triple negative uh, breast cancer. If you want to read about this, I put a reference in there. This is published in June of this year. It's a very nice summary of the current, um, current state of the art, but I'm gonna talk specifically about some of these treatments. Um, the, the, the VEGF, this is a, a, a growth factor. I'm, you may have, I'm sure you're familiar with Avastin. Avastin uh, is a, uh, we know that cancer cells to maintain their growth, develop new blood vessels to feed the growth of, uh, of the developing tumors. And that is stimulated through this, this growth factor called VEGF or VEGF, or vascular endothelial growth factor. There are drugs which attack that. We'll talk about immunotherapy. And I'll show you an example of what's called a PARP inhibitor and some other drugs. We'll go through this next fairly quickly. VEGF, this is a, a protein that's expressed in, in about between 30 and 60% of, of, of triple net, that should be N, triple negative breast cancer. It pro pro promotes new blood, uh, blood uh, vessel formation, so-called angiogenesis. And Avastin is a, is a monoclonal antibody that, that deactivates this. It, it was shown to have some benefit 
in um, triple negative breast cancer, and it was approved in combination with chemotherapy. This is Taxol. Um, however, the FDA actually re withdrew that approval, although there are now ongoing studies looking at, the, at this drug, Avastin, Bevacizumab, in combination with both uh, immunotherapy and other newer, chemo newer chemotherapy drugs. For some patients, those who have a very high concentration of VEGF, then this drug does have real benefit. Immunotherapy, um, we know that triple negative breast cancer, I mentioned this earlier, that some of these uh, tumors have a very high um, concentration of lymphocytes, which is the immune cell present in the tumors, indicating that, that the patient is immune system is trying to uh, attack to fight the cancer itself. And we know that the, I'm sure you've all seen ads on TV for Keytruda and Obdivo, mainly in lung cancer. These are called immune checkpoint inhibitors. But in fact, these immune checkpoint inhibitors, pembrolizumab is Keytruda. These drugs are approved in combination with chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer, particularly those which have a high concentration of this protein known as PDL1 which is present in about 10, 20% of patients. And a high concentration is defined as what's called a C, CPS, which is a combined positive score of greater than 10. Again, the details aren't too important. The point is that this is a very, very uh, effective form of treatment, immunotherapy, in that subset of, of triple negative breast cancer where, where the immune system is in fact uh, activated. Um, PARP inhibitors are oral medications, and these are specifically used in patients of the BRCA gene. Remember, I mentioned earlier that 14% or so of patients with triple negative breast cancer they have, a, have a, a BRCA mutation, and those patients are uniquely sensitive, sensitive to an oral agent called a PARP inhibitor, which inhibit, inhibits a, 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 an enzyme system. BRCA, both BRCA and PARP repaired DNA damage. And so if a patient has a BRCA mutation, their BRCA system is, doesn't work and therefore they need PARP to repair uh, damage. So when we're deliberately trying to kill cells, cancer cells, those cancers are uniquely um, uh, sensitive to uh, uh, Olaparib and Velaparib, which are PARP inhibitors. And here's an example. This is a patient of mine who I treat, this is about four years ago, uh, presented with this large mass of malignant lymph nodes, BRCA2 mutation, and with six weeks of taking uh, four uh, pills of Limparza daily, the mass completely disappeared. She remains in, in a complete remission, now uh, almost four years out, simply taking these pills. So this is control of of, of triple negative breast cancer in, in the patient with the BRCA gene mutation. I think I'll skip this because this is, it was hoped that those patients who had the LAR, the, the luminal androgen receptor positive breast cancer would respond to the kind of drugs that we use to treat prostate cancer. These are selective androgen um, receptor modulators like, like uh, bitalutamide and enzalutamide. The results have been very disappointing, but this is a, an area of ongoing research in this type of triple negative disease. This one I'm going to skip because this one, none of these drugs in, in this area are yet approved, but there is some promise. But again, these are, this is a, a, a pathway which is identified by, by more intensive studying of patients with triple negative breast cancer. And about a quarter of patients may in fact benefit from these drugs. I want to um, mention one specific drug which actually is approved for triple negative breast cancer. What, what you see here, this Y-shaped structure is an antibody. That's the, that's the, 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 um, the uh, design, the shape of a, an antibody molecule. And this is the first of a drug was called an antibody drug conjugate. ADCs, there are, there are several of these that are approved for different forms of cancer, some lymphomas and also for HER2 positive breast cancer. But this is a, this antibody is an antibody 
uh, directed against a protein called TROP2, which is present in triple negative breast cancer. And what, what they do here is the antibody carries the active chemo drug, which is linked to it, this orange circle here, into the vicinity of the cancer cell where the chemotherapy is released. And you'll hear more and more over the next 10 years about antibody drug conjugates. Um, but this one it has already been approved for triple negative breast cancer based on a study called the ASCENT study, which was published uh, uh, last year and shows that when patients with triple negative breast cancer were treated either with chemotherapy of the uh, physician's choice or uh, this drug called it's actually Trevelde is its uh, other name, Sacituzumab. You know, any drug, any name ending in MAB, M-A-B tells you it's an antibody. So these patients got, got Sacituzumab, these patients got, got chemotherapy, and there's a 52% reduction in the risk of death in the patients treated with, mono, with this monoclonal antibody. And so this, this drug is now available and we, we prescribe it every day in the clinic to treat patients with triple negative breast cancer. This is the first of this, this class of drugs here. I want to finish by telling you about another antibody drug conjugate. I say, is this really, is it really triple negative breast cancer? I'll take five minutes to, to, to explain this to you. It's very exciting. Conventionally, the way we diagnose a cancer is being HER2 positive, is we stain it. Just ignore these two columns over here. Just look at this column here, IHC. IHC stands for immunohistochemistry. So these cancer cells are stained uh, looking for the presence of, of the HER2 protein. Up until now, the only HER2 positive result would be IHC3+. plus. IHC zero, there's absolutely no staining. There's a tiny amount of brown here, and there's a little bit more here. This would be considered IHC one, IHC two. But conventionally, the only HER2 positive uh, breast cancer was one which was IHC three plus, or confirmed by a test called a FISH test, where we look at the DNA content, the HER2 DNA. Why does this matter? Well, it matters because over half of the patients who conventionally would be considered HER2 negative here, uh, uh, either HER2 one plus or two plus, in fact, have enough HER2 to, um, to respond to uh, HER2 directed therapy. So the current paradigm has always been you either are the HER2 negative or you're HER2 positive. But in fact, 55% of patients who were thought to be HER2 negative are in fact, ha have meaningful, clinically meaningful levels of HER2 and will respond to, here's the, see the monoclonal antibody again. This time this antibody is directed against HER2 with chemotherapy attached to it. This is a drug called inher 2 which is trastuzumab, which is the antibody against HER2 uh, with, a, with a chemotherapy drug stuck onto it called um, deruxifan. So what happens is the antibody gets inside the cell where the chemotherapy is released and kills the cell. And also it can, it can diffuse out into neighboring tumor cells. And so a Study was reported out this year. This study was presented at ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, in June of this year in Chicago, and 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 got a standing ovation, which I've never seen before, and it got a standing ovation for this reason. This is the study: patients who were HER2 low, IHC one plus or two plus, were randomized to either receive this drug in HER2, trastuzumab, deruxetan or chemotherapy of the patient with physician choice. And the, and the, the results are shown here. You can see that in all these patients, there was significant, there's the p-value, improvement in progression-free survival and overall survival when compared with chemotherapy. So this was really a paradigm shift. 
for the first time ever, patients who in the past would only have been offered chemotherapy uh, have been shown that fully 55% of them are eligible to receive HER2 um, directed therapy with a significant improvement in their, in their uh, response to treatment and their survival. And as I say, this, um, the, by the way, this led to FDA approval of the drug it, literally in three months, which is unheard of. Um, so the, the implication is that up to 40, about 55% may actually not have triple negative breast cancer at all, but instead have her, in other words, they, they don't, they're, they are ERP are negative, but they're not HER2 negative. This new category of HER2 low has been introduced and, that, and they are there for candidates for this drug uh, and in fact, uh, we've started treating these patients ever since this presentation in June, and we're seeing some spectacular results. So the point is that we're now going back and looking at every patient that we've been labeled as being HER2 negative and re-examining uh, re to decide to determine whether in fact, they're likely to benefit from this. So this is a very exciting uh, development literally this year. So I'm gonna finish with this last slide, just to a summary of what I tried to show you, that basically advanced triple negative breast cancer is a, a, a heterogeneous group of different cancers. Overall, they have, they have a poor prognosis, although that is changing. They may uh, um, respond to VEGF inhibitors. Many of them are likely to, to benefit from immune therapy. Early stage breast cancer is best treated with preoperative chemotherapy and immunotherapy followed by surgery. And if they achieve a pathologic complete response, then they have a very excellent chance of cure. Traditional chemotherapy is still the most used strategy. However, new, these new biomarkers that I've mentioned have led to uh, uh, the development of new treatments, some of which are approved already Tridelvi or Sacatuzumab is already FDA approved. And we're now seeing um, PARP inhibitors are approved for BRCA patients. And we're also seeing these uh, ongoing um, immunotherapy for patients who are likely to respond to that. And where there are many ongoing clinical trials um, to improve the results of treatment in metastatic triple ne uh, negative breast cancer. But for now, it's certainly uh, important to re-examine all of these patients to determine whether they truly are triple negative or may benefit from HER2-directed therapy. And with that, I'm going to stop. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Citrin. All right, I don't see any questions in the chat box. So I think, unless anyone wants to stop me, going once, going twice. Yeah, um, Megan, I have a question yes. for him. Um, is the doctor suggesting that we should maybe get our tumor reassessed for the HER2 status to see? Uh, if there was possible, you know, uh, even a little bit expressed and also um, should it be reviewed for a subtype? Because one, I never was told that it had a sub, that there was any subtypes when I had that eight years ago. Right. The, the answer is this, you sir, uh, we're, we're looking back at every, remember when a patient has a biopsy done, the con conventionally has always been reported out as being e uh, her ERP and HER2. And many, many, many of our patients are being labeled uh, HER2 one plus negative. And, and up until literally this year, if it was, uh, if it's HER2 if it's her one plus or two plus and FISH negative, then that's negative. We don't, we, 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 we never would consider HER2 treatment. I, in my own practice, in the last three months, I've probably started nearly 20 patients who would who, who fell into this category with her with with uh, in her too, um, and several of them were seeing dramatic responses. So absolutely, I would say, and and it may be you don't have to have another biopsy to go back because the the 
um, you just go back and look at the original pathology report. That's what your, your oncologist should do. And, and, and many of them will say, if they say ER, um, if they say HER2 one plus or two plus, then that's good enough for the insurance company. They will approve in HER2. Is it because as I say, even before it got FDA approval, which happened in, in late September, the insurance companies recognized the, the, the dramatic results of this. If you want to read about this study, if you Google Destiny Breast 04, that'll get you into it. You'll see all of this information out there. And uh, yeah, I would say any woman um, who, who is still undergoing, you know, who needs active treatment should certainly, her oncologist should certainly go back and look at this. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Did we have one more question? If not, I think Dr. Roy is ready to rock. And we'll also have some time at the end as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Dr. Roy, I will uh, leave the floor to you. Okay. So first of all, can everybody see me okay? Or Megan, can you just give me a heads up? Because I can't see anybody. Yes, we can see you. Okay, perfect. So I am going to introduce myself to everybody just in case you haven't seen me speak before and you don't know me well. And I want to remind everybody that we're recording. So unless you want to be on video, I would suggest not turning on your video. I want to remind you that you can use the chat to talk to us. And my fellow and colleague, Dr. Mensa, is monitoring the chat. So if anybody has questions, we can answer them there. Um, and I just want to thank Gildas for holding this panel and thank Dr. Citrin. That was really lovely. And it was lovely to hear him talk about the new results at ASCO because they were practice changing for many, many people. I'm going to take a very different approach and talk about supportive care, and it'll be a lot more general and perhaps more um, targeted to patients. So it'll be a, a, a different tone than what you've heard before. And then as Megan said at the end, we'll have an open Q&A. And if any questions come to mind for Dr. Citrin, he'll be hopefully he's still on and he can answer them then. So I'm Shaba Roy. As you guys may know, I am a uh, natural medicine doctor. I'm a fancy kind. So what that means is I have both the conventional medical exposure to oncology care and uh, special training in natural medicine. So my board specialty is in something called integrative oncology. Here in Michigan, we call ourselves supportive care oncology. And what I want to talk about today is um, how we would manage some supportive care issues with triple negative, and then give you a chance to ask me specific questions. Okay, so I'm going to also, I don't normally use a PowerPoint. As you guys know, I like to speak off the cuff, but for today, just because I know that I'm going to be saying a lot of words and people are going to need to take notes, I wanted to give you a PowerPoint to look at. So that's not what I wanted to do. I want to share my screen. I want to give you just a portion of my screen. Okay, here we go. That's good. Megan, can you see just my PowerPoint here and the notes on the slides on the side? Yep. Awesome. Okay. So we're, uh, we're also going to be picking up just where Dr. Citrin left off. And I'm in the chat and also up here, I'm gonna give you, uh, oh, that looks like it's cutting it off a bit, isn't it? Um, hmm, let me make this a little smaller. There we go. Um, I'm gonna also give you access to us and how to find us because uh, in Michigan, this is an unlicensed field. It's kind of the wild, wild west, if you've, as you've heard me say before. Natural medicine is not well regulated um, in many states. And so that means a lot of the time you can end up seeing someone who's not board certified or who may have some exposure and some expertise, but may be guiding you in a direction that would interfere with or compete with your cancer treatment. And sometimes even 
and sometimes even be harmful to you. So I wanna make sure that if you are seeing someone who's in integrative medicine, that you're seeing someone who's uh, board certified. So I wanna start by saying, are alternatives to care appropriate? Because we do get a lot of patients who come to us wanting quote unquote alternatives to care. And um, one, it's not legal in this country to offer alternatives to care. And two, it's not always the best choice for most patients. So in our practice, we really try to work with all aspects of your team to get you the best outcomes possible. And as Dr. Citrin mentioned, with triple negative breast, this is even more important because stage for stage, there's a larger absolute benefit to adjuvant chemo among patients with triple negative compared to those even with hormone positive disease. And what that means is when we look at like all the randomized controlled trials, and we put them all together and maybe come up with a population of close to 7,000 women with triple negative breast, there's a significantly larger reduction in the risk of recurrence and a better chance at overall survival. And I'm talking about a difference between 55% versus 20% in patients who choose to face their fears and get chemotherapy in conjunction with supportive care. So this is very important, particularly in this group of people, but for all our patients, we wanna see you have the best outcomes possible. The best outcomes are usually an integrative approach. So when we're seeing a patient with, who uh, does have triple negative disease and is getting therapy, uh, the question is, what is our job? So pre and post surgical plans to optimize aesthetic outcomes. I'm not going to focus on surgery at all because it's not really a big, a big value point here. I'm going to talk more about chemotherapy. Our job is to prepare the patient for chemotherapy so that they go through treatment feeling well. And that's by helping to prevent side effects, preserving organ function, using natural therapy that's not contraindicated, and make chemosensitized uh, drugs. That means make the the cancer drugs stronger or more selective to the cancer cells while protecting our normal cells. Okay. Um, Megan, you can still see these slides, even though they're a little smaller. Is that right? Yes. Awesome. And they're easy to read? The slides on the side are a little difficult, but you can see them very perfect when you're on it. Okay, good. Okay. I don't mean on the left here and the right here. I mean, just, oh, yeah. okay. Right. Good. Perfect. Okay. So let's move on from that. So Dr. Citrin already talked to you guys about the drugs that are used. I'm not going to go over them other than to mention the biggies, which are adriamycin, cytoxin, taxotere, or taxanes. Zolota is often used. Um, and he mentioned some newer ones, Limparza, immunotherapies, and, and hair too, um, which is a really exciting development, but carries a risk with cardiotoxicity and the normal risks with monoclonal antibodies. So what I'm going to focus on is how we prevent side effects in these groups. And the great thing about how I'm approaching this is it's also useful for a lot of you who may be struggling with other types of cancers um, that have similar drug risks uh, and uh, how we can prevent side effects with those as well. So our job really is to prepare our patients. Um, we want you to go through treatment feeling well. So we focus on strategies for prevention of mouth sores, for example. So that means making sure we see our dentist early. We do a gum prep. Um, we're gonna, I'm going to talk about Be Well with AIM later on, but if you go to bewellwithaim.com, which is where we list natural therapies, there's a bunch of toothpaste that are sensitive for, that are for sensitive mouths as we're going through chemotherapy. We talk about taste changes, which we use zinc, cold and flu lozenges for, and a folic acid swish and spit. We use a baking soda, baking soda mouthwash that we design ourselves that's very effective for prevention of mouth sores, but we might vary that formula. Like I might add hydrogen peroxide to it. I might change the volume or the amount of baking soda. I might add essential oils. It really depends on how big the risk is to the patient. 
Now, I know a lot of you are going to be like, oh, I'm missing that. I couldn't take all those notes. That's okay, because one, we're going to post this. And two, I did create these slides so you'd be able to take notes afterwards when it's posted. These are examples of the kinds of toothpaste that are available to you that aren't available over the counter um, that would be available to cancer patients. So for example, neem toothpaste or propolis-based toothpaste or calendula, which is a nice vulnerary or wound healer. Um, we talk about mental comfort and emotional prep with our patients. In fact, we have a whole preparing for chemotherapy class. And one of the things that we do there is talk about what to pack in your bag. And I'm going to focus on a couple of things like lavender essential oil. And the reason we do that is because we're looking at strategies to prevent anticipatory anxiety, which can increase the risk of nausea. Um, and we want to use strategies that have evidence to them. So guided visualizations are a great example of that. Um, healthjourneys.com, which you can find uh, by Googling um, or just going to healthjourneys.com. If you click on, whoops, I'm just trying to get a pen here. If you, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. How do I go back? One more second. Let me just go back to that, you guys. I was trying to draw on this, but it's not going to let me do that. So you're going to just hear me talk and pretend to point. Uh, uh, healthjourneys.com, if you click on that, you can look for guided visualizations like healing trauma, chemotherapy, or fight cancer. These guided visualizations have excellent data. In fact, they lower the risk of side effects like anticipatory nausea by 26% in some trials. Um, so what do I mean when I'm talking about evidence-informed or evidence-based? Sometimes, especially when we're in this setting and we have all this medicine and all these scientific terms being thrown at us, it may feel like, well, this is sort of a throwaway, right? Lavender essential oil or guided visualization, they may feel like soft therapies, but in fact, they're really, really powerful and they're pretty well evidenced. So in our clinic, we only use evidence-informed or preferably evidence-based therapies. That means therapies that have been shown in clinical trial to be effective. So when I'm talking about lavender, I'm talking about actual data, for example, looking at lavender in a cancer population and looking at particularly anxiety or quality of sleep or pain or vital signs. Um, in fact, this systemic review, which looked at 10,000 participants, um, showed that uh, lavender in a quantitative synthesis, that means like statistic, statisticians coming together and synthesizing all of that data, that lavender inhalation and oral uh, intake reduces anxiety levels measured on any validated anxiety scale, which is incredible because to have that much positive data is unusual. And I think oncology, they're so focused on getting you well and focused on your tumor. We don't do as good a job, even in our comprehensive cancer centers, at looking at the other robust data that exists to get us through treatment tolerating it and tolerating it well. So a lot of times patients come into the clinic and they tell me, oh, they've done research on something. And as doctors, that can be really hard because the internet is in some ways a dangerous place, right? It uh, gives people a sense that they're doing research when they may not, in fact, really know what they're looking at. Um, a lot of these websites are super sophisticated now, in fact, in getting data to you. So um, I want to talk to you about how to look at data. So the best place to actually go is pubmed.gov, which you can see here, even though it's super tiny, it's pubmed.gov. And I know this is really difficult to hear, to see. Um, Megan, if you could go ahead and mute everybody but me. I know this is really difficult to see, but if, as you can see, I typed in the search lavender and anxiety. And what this does is it pulls up all the data published anywhere in the world about those two things. And as you can maybe see here, there's about 300 
trials, looking at lavender and anxiety. That's a lot of data, right? You can even filter on the left here for clinical trial. Again, I know this is hard to see, but what I've done is click on clinical trial on the left, and there's still a robust amount of data, almost 100 trials, um, many of them randomized trials and clinical trials looking at lavender and its role in anxiety in a cancer population. And I can specify for cancer and change the terms around to, for example, the Latin term for lavender and get even cleaner data. So when your friends and your family tell you, hey, you should try this, you should try that, I always recommend that my patients go to pubmed.gov, put it in and send us the link so we can help you to assess whether it's really appropriate for you or not. Hydration. So hydration is super important for patients getting chemotherapy. Our patients receive instructions for hydration that include electrolytes. We collaborate and help navigate the system so that they're receiving fluids perhaps on day two in the infusion center. If we can't achieve an adequate void in the first cycle, that means getting them to pee as often as we'd like. Um, we also use herbs and a medicinal tea that we compound directly for our patients. I don't really trust pesticide exposure in Michigan. So the herbs that we use are um, sustainably sourced and we're very careful about exposure. We use whole herbs and we use ones like Althea, Almus, Zia Maze, Calendula, Alfalfa. I know these are all words you may not remember or know, but they're things like marshmallow or slippery elm. And what's wonderful about them is they're vulnerables and they're demulsants, and they help protect the, the transitional epithelium, which is the type of cell that lines the general urinary tract, which prevents irritation to these tissues. On the whole, almost every patient who sees us gets a compounded tea, which is a low dose, does not contraindicated with chemotherapy, and I don't have patients with cystitis or bladder issues going through treatment. Um, so that's my anecdotal information there, but it's super, super helpful. Um, for immune support and infection prophylaxis, oncology does a good job here, but we augment with medicinal foods um, like ginger, garlic, bone broth. Ginger and garlic as supplements can compete with some of your drug classes like taxanes because they use the same doorway in the liver. So we may or may not use these in therapeutic doses depending on how your drugs are being dosed. For example, we might give you something on your off week that we don't give you on your on week depending on how long the drug stays in your system, like the elimination half-life. Um, Garlic might be a hard one for people, but if you take one little clove and you nick it in a couple places, microwave it for 15 seconds, that takes away the taste and the smell, and you can take that with a spoonful of honey. Um, we talk a lot about vaccines and herd immunity. I don't want to get in the weeds with you guys, so we're not going to discuss vaccines today. We talk about hygiene and restrictions, and we give um, comfort protocols for growth stimulators. So a lot of you might be getting things like new Lasta or new Nupogen and things that might be helpful would be things like Epsom salt baths, wintergreen oil, castor oil topically, along with, of course, Tylenol or ibuprofen. Cardiotoxicity is a big risk. So when we're talking about um, doxorubicin or Herceptin as it's bound in, in HER2, um, and even some of the other drugs that are not known to be as cardiotoxic, we have an acute reaction where we can have... Um, the heart can be hurt acutely at that moment in time, or it can happen over a longer period of time, like five to 10 years. And so we work really hard with this population on preventing damage to your heart. And uh, as Dr. Citrin mentioned at the very beginning of his presentation, you might have missed it. Uh, triple negative breast is more occurs more frequently in Black and now we know Hispanic women. Black women in particular and Hispanic women, depending on the region from which they or which they live, are at higher risk of heart disease anyways and present kind of uniquely. So we're not just treating to um, cardiotoxicity during treatment, but we're also looking at past medical history and 
post-treatment survivorship to optimize cardiac outcomes. So there's some decent data on CoQ10 with adriamycin for prevention of acute and long-term toxicity. And we might augment that with uh, bowel neutral mag glycinate, which is a good vasodilator, meaning gives the blood vessels some flex. Um, fish oil, dose titrated to patient risk and past medical history. For example, if someone's a smoker, fish oil can be dangerous to give with cancer. Um, and we may add things to their tea formulas like hawthorn, hibiscus, rose hips, berberine. Um, if they came into care, if you came into care with metabolic risk factors, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that more later. Again, hawthorn, just like garlic and ginger, is an example of a CYP3A4 inhibitor, which just is a fancy way of saying it uses the same pathway in the liver as some of your drugs, and you can compete particularly with taxanes. In fact, some of these natural therapies are not really benign, like green tea can interfere with the efficacy of taxanes by 64% at certain doses. So you have to be really cautious about how you bring these things together. And it depends on the person. For one person, fish oil may be beneficial. For another person, it may actually increase the risk of other kinds of problems or recurrence of higher grade kinds of cancers. Um, we go a little bit further than your primary care doctor would do or your oncologist in protecting your heart and survivorship. So we don't just look at left ejection fraction, which is the amount of blood that your heart is pumping out to the body um, when this, as um, kind of the that's what they do at baseline to see if your heart is doing well. We also do serial EKGs and we look at some blood markers like homocysteine, high sensitive CRP, lipid panels, D-dimer, lipoprotein A. These are lab tests that help give us kind of a holistic predictive picture for how your heart is gonna do overall and over time. And we take into account cultural, social, and racial factors in gender, excuse me, not gender, sex factors into how we treat the heart overall. Um, although, of course, we're talking about breasts today, so really our girls, women, excuse me, um, we co-manage with cardio -onc and cardiology. So, uh, with the reason we partner with them is it's so very, very important to have uh, someone available for intervention if necessary. Peripheral neuropathies. So numbness and tingling in the fingers and toes is easy to prevent, but hard to treat. So I don't like to chase it. I like to prevent, prevent, prevent. Both the platinums and the taxanes act on the nerves in the periphery by different mechanisms. One of them may be directly toxic to the nerves, and the other one, when you poop it out, it needs to bind to magnesium in order to be chelated out of the system. And when you pull magnesium out of the body, that can also make it harder for the nerves to work. So the good thing is a lot of the things that we talked about earlier that we're using for, for example, protecting your heart are also useful for protecting your nerves. I want to just make a point that B vitamins are helpful, but not folic acid or iron. Folic acid and iron are gross stimulators for cancer cells, and the dose really matters. So it's a very small dose window for B6, for example, for it to be effective. Now you may be thinking, Dr. Roy, why aren't you telling me the dose? Again, everything with our patients is individual. So I don't wanna give you something super specific and then you run out to Kroger, gosh forbid, and you buy something that could end up being contraindicated or uh, harmful for you. So I'm not trying to keep information from you. I'm trying to give you a general sense and I will empower you as we move forward in ways to access high quality supplements and making good choices. Um, don't forget PT, yoga, the physical therapies are very, very important for nerve health. Low counts. So again, oncology does a great job in maintaining your counts with some of the drugs like cytoxin that might be myelosuppressive, which is just a fancy way of saying it um, suppresses the amount of white blood cells you're making. A lot of times, as a side note, patients are afraid of of drug treatment because they're worried it's going to knock out their immune system. Your immune system is super complicated. And what you see in a CBC um, 
in your that's occurring right in your bone marrow is not it's just the surface of your immune system it also regenerates and there's ways to support you through treatment so we don't just use growth stimulators um, we also support growth stimulators and we use polysaccharide extracts from mushrooms um, nutrition so medicinal nutrition is also helpful here particularly bone broth high dose melatonin which we do not use with hematological cancers like leukemia, lymphoma, vitamin D, and exercise. And when I'm talking about exercise, I'm just talking about pulse exercising. So high impact, give a, a bump to the bone, low intensity for 15 minutes a day. So like stomping up and down the stairs, for example, I'm not talking about going to the gym. And of course, we take into account fracture risk and other problems that you may be having. In other words, when we design your exercise protocol, we're, we're again, we're designing something specific for you and your needs. So the main tool in oncology's toolbox, of course, for low counts is to dose down on the drug or delay a cycle. And we never, never want to do this. We love um, we want to give you a chance to stay on the dose that you're on um, and maintain through your course of treatment um, so our patients do well throughout because when we dose down or we delay or skip a cycle, we're giving cancer cells, which are your own cells um, and fairly intelligent, a chance to develop resistance. And that's something we're trying to avoid. So we rather get our patients early, aggressively prepare for treatment and pre-treat. Um, we don't want to have patients, quote unquote, fail. And they don't usually with our, with our practice. I mean, I actually don't ever. Um, hand foot syndrome, palmar plantar dysarthesia. It's just a fancy way of saying problems with the hands and feet, which we can sometimes see with Zalota, which is given when, when triple negative has moved away from the breast to somewhere else in the body. And in this case, we would avoid foods supplemented with things like folic acid and iron. You're going to see that in foods that kids eat because the government supplements those foods to avoid um, birth defects in young pregnancies. Um, moisturizing, 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 and treating your hands and feet like baby hands and feet. Um, and actually, uh, I don't want to run over too far, so I'm going to just skip a little bit um, and move on. Diarrhea, constipation, colitis. This is so huge. Bowel regulation is so huge because as the field is changing, Dr. Citrin and I were just talking about this. I know I look fairly young, but I'm very old. Um, and when I was in fellowship almost 10 years ago, targeted therapies, which Dr. Citrin touched on, were brand, brand new. And now they've kind of exploded. But along with some of these targeted therapies, especially monoclonal antibodies like Keytruda, we're seeing um, a rise in colitis. Colitis means inflammation in the GI tract. Um, and we see it fairly frequently. So uh, we don't like to symptom treat. If we have a situation that persists for 48 hours, well, over 48 hours, we'll use um, symptom management, but we like to use bowel regulators. Um, and we pre treat heavily for colitis using quercetin in doses that are not contraindicated, hydration, walking protocols, and GI protocols that use herbs like demulcent and vulnerates that I talked about before, which are significant underrated um, uh, actors in this field. We also use an onboarding program with Zofran and Ginger in the first six weeks of Limparza to prevent nausea. So very quickly, I probably am not going to get have time to go through survivorship, but I do want to touch on um, supplements. So spelled incorrectly here, but it seems like supplements are important. Why can't I just buy them over the counter from Amazon or from Kroger? Um, so supplement quality is very risky in this country. It's not well regulated, which means the government regulates supplements the way they regulate a banana. It goes through the USDA, not through the FDA. So they're looking for things like, is this going to kill you? They're not looking for source contamination um, to some extent, dose, um, or, uh, or even efficacy. And so, which means, does it work? 
So it's very, very risky to be buying supplements over the counter because you genuinely don't know what you're getting. And I think that's where people get in the weeds with the internet is there's a lot of sophisticated internet sites that tell you this is safe, this is not. The truth is there are really only six to 10 pharmaceutical grade supplement companies that distribute to hospitals and doctors in this country. The other sad truth is they're not available um, generally to patients. You need a doctor to give you access to those supplements. Those are companies like Thorne, for example, Pure. Now they've started marketing directly to consumer, um, but they there's price differences and it's still risky to you. So let's take, for example, something like curcumin. All of you have heard of turmeric. Turmeric is an herb that's sourced out of India that we know has some powerful antineoplastic or cancer-fighting potential. However, it's an herb, it's a food, right? So it's not as powerful as a drug would be. If this is curcumin, um, excuse me, if this is turmeric and we extract from it a little piece of it or a compound called curcumin, that substance given in very high doses, like two to six grams a day, can function as a cancer fighter and can even be combined with drugs like, for example, Zolota. It can act as a chemo sensitizer for Zolota. The problem with curcumin, however, is because it's sourced from overseas as part of a root, when it's imported, the government uses, or not, sorry, not the government, but the country uses a solvent to clean it called a 1,2-dichloroethane. That solvent contains carcinogens that can cause cancer, and the government has issued over 28 warning letters to the industry, the supplement industry, asking them to pull the product. However, because it's deregulated, they don't have to do so, and they know patients want it. So that means you're getting a product that may have some benefits for you, but also contains some cancer-causing compounds. The other problem with curcumin is, as I said, it needs to be given in very high doses, it's difficult to absorb, so it has to be combined with a fat and with a substance from black pepper. And we talked about earlier about something called CYP3A4. Curcumin interacts with most chemotherapies because it uses the same doorway in the liver. So that's just a small example of, an, of one natural therapy that has many reasons or many problems with it that forces us to choose pharmaceutical brands when we're using that particular herb. This Be Well With AIM is where we allow our patients to access pharmaceutical grade herbs. This is the password. You do need to talk to me um, in order to use that only because I don't like to make it available to public, but there are only a couple patients um, or a couple people on this talk. It's a very small audience. So I think it's safe to post that up there. And also, as you can see in the chat, I'm hoping that Dr. Mensa remembered to post it. There's a little form. If you click on that, it'll go over. You can ask your questions on there about natural medicine, supplement, supplement supportive care, and we'll answer you directly. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up here just by talking briefly about survivorship. So as patients go into survivorship who have triple negative breast, as Dr. Citrin mentioned, um, the risk of recurrence is there, right? And it can be more risky in some ways um, because the cancer doesn't behave as, the, way, the way a hormone positive cancer would behave. And so when we're looking at survivorship, it may feel that the guidelines that impact metabolic markers, for example, may be more significant for a hormone positive cancer, but that's not necessarily the case. Obesity is a soft risk for triple negative breast. So we don't hesitate to use the same guidelines as we do for hormone positive breast. And we may even be a little more aggressive due to the age, meaning younger age and presentation of these patients. So again, I don't have time to go over all of this, but I wanted to just point out to you that the government posts guidelines for survivorship. Again, oncology is great at treating, but our comprehensive cancer centers are not great at directing to survivorship. But there are exquisite guidelines here. If you go to supportive care, which is what I what we do, you see there's all uh, all the all of the things that are sort of under our purview to treat. And then if you click on survivorship here, you see that there's 
a lot of chapters um, or guidelines on how to manage survivorship. Um, and these can be even more specific for breast. This is general survivorship guidelines. I just wanna put, give one push for gildas and for stress management, and then I will let Dr. Citrin say his piece in the q and I'm so sorry, one, one push. So there's a push in the scientific and pseudoscientific community to beat cancer patients over the head with the idea that sugar fights can sugar feeds cancer, excuse me. And to some extent, this is true. Sugar feeds everything. It is true that cancer cells are unique in that they have metabolic derangements that allow them to use calories more efficiently, but approaches to regulating fat and sugar need to be sophisticated to avoid starving the person in an attempt to starve the cancer. And unfortunately, the climate in this country of being fat phobic lends itself to this information and misinformation so that obesity is considered a cause instead of metabolic markers and food gets assigned a morality like good or bad food. When in reality, bananas don't cause cancer, neither does rice, um, neither frankly do Kit Kats. Um, you can have be overweight and have excellent metabolic parameters. You can be thin and have poor metabolic parameters. The biggest contributors to these differentials are exercise and stress, in fact. So while nutrition can be transformative, stress is pro-inflammatory and the driver behind most metabolic issues. So stress management is the most profound tool in survivorship. Um, the most evidence means of reducing stress is something called mindfulness-based stress reduction. So it's a combination of yoga, breath work, and meditation. And the data, as we talked about before when we were talking about PubMed, the data is robust, showing, for example, that a combination of daily practice of these three things, lower serum and salivary cortisol, which is your stress hormone across the board. So this is one of the most evidence categories in cancer care. And the reason why is cortisol, which is released by your adrenal gland, which sits on top of your kidneys, and it's released in response to stress, travels to the liver and tells the liver to dump sugar into the bloodstream. And the reason why it's doing this is to give sugar as a fast fuel so that you can run and hide or freeze. But as we've gone through, our life has changed and the world has changed and things have evolved, we now live in a world where we have constant stress signals. And this, this system doesn't accommodate for chronic stress. It only has an acute response. So we're seeing changes in how we use sugar because of the way that we respond to stress. So I just want to say one quick thing about Gilda's. If you guys logged on today to the website, to Gilda's website, um, and you uh, uh, saw that they had their beautiful calendar up. They had so many things up there, art therapy, yoga, a beading circle, a Reiki healing circle. Gilda does, Gilda does a beautiful job of actually bringing this data in a practical way to you, um, better than we could do uh, as oncology support and better than medical oncology could do. So that's it for me. We're going to open up for q and I'm so glad that I had the chance to talk to all of you today. I know it was information dense. I talked fast, especially, you know, you're used to me kind of interacting with you. I'm going to let Megan take over now. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Roy. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Roy? And I believe, yes, Dr. Citrin is here still as well. <clears throat> As always, we love having you guys. So you, if you guys want to post your questions in the chat too, we can go through them there too, or you can just unmute yourself or raise your hand. If you look at the bottom there where it says more, um, not more, where, where is it where you can raise your hand? Oh, reactions. Yep, on the bottom. Yeah. You can do like that. We got it. Thumbs up from Anne. Thank you. I know that was a lot of information. Um, the contact information for Dr. Roy 
um, was in the beginning there, but you can always call us directly at Gilda's Club if you're a member and we give that out all the time as well. So either way you can, um, if you think of something later, you can email, I can always provide you with um, their contact over there. They're wonderful. And then of course, Dr. Citron, we work very closely um, with you all over there as well. We've had uh, many speakers. No question, but thank you for sharing the role of stress in cancer. Oh, good, you, Margaret. Yeah, I think one of the biggest pieces uh, to that is people say, well, how do I manage stress when I'm feeling stressed all the time? If you just have a regular daily practice of a little bit of yoga, and there's a great YouTube video, a uh, YouTube channel called um, uh, Yoga with Adrian. Um, she offers uh, anywhere from uh, two minute to Adrian, two minute to uh, 40 minute videos. Um, you combine that with a breathwork practice and a simple breathwork practice can be a four, four, four. So inhale for four, hold for four, exhale for four, hold for four, doing that four times and doing that four times a day. Um, and meditation. So those guided visualizations we talked about on healthjourneys.com have lovely guided visualizations that are actually targeted for patients who are facing cancer and for their family members. All right. Any questions about that or nutrition, supportive care at all? This is the first time we've had silence. I know, what a quiet. <laughs> it must have been super thorough. <laughs> Questions, just absorption. The PowerPoints. The PowerPoints <laughs> intimidate people. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess if there are no other questions, we can wrap it up. But like I said, if you think of something later, I can definitely share Dr. Roy's contact with you as well as Dr. Citrin's. Um, thank you both for joining us. And everyone have a lovely evening and enjoy a few more, you know, days of nice weather. Yes, Dr. Roy. I just want to say one last thing about Cancer Treatment Centers of America. So Dr. Citrin mentioned that he's a breast oncologist with CTCA in Zion, which is close to Chicago. They have doctors like me on staff that are covered through your uh, treatment with them. So um, that's also a nice place to start uh, if you're wondering about even a first opinion, second opinion for cancer care, um, you get a real holistic approach there, uh, which is a little different from other cancer hospitals. Okay, hope that was useful to everybody. Yes. Good. Okay, have a great night. I'm sure I'll see you all soon. Okay, talk soon. Thanks. Thanks, Dr.